this today, uh, we sort of uh, we talked about some different nuances for the paraceller and superceller approaches. Today, we really going to talk about um, the various pituitary transposition techniques. Um, the large parts were developed by my um, mentor at um, Stanford, where I did my fellowship, and now some of which I've adopted in practice. Some of these you'll be familiar with. And the point is, um, what is the need for transposition? Why do we perform it? Why do we need to move the pituitary gland out of the way? And the fundamental reason for doing that is when you want to access that retroinfundibular area, the upper part of the clivus and the interpeductor system, that's where you're trying to get to. And if you have someone with a, a, a functioning gland, uh, you have to try and establish why, you know, the easiest way is to cut the gland and totally out of the way, but then that's not an option in people who have partially functioning or a fully functioning gland. So there are multiple competing techniques uh, which are used by various people around the world. And um, the, the commonest technique is the subcellular extradural, and I'll go through that uh, in terms of what is involved. Uh, the intradural technique, which is also another technique, and that's what I've sort of adopted in my practice since finishing. It's perhaps one of the easier ones to do. And the intradural transcavernous technique, which also has parallel um, uh, implications for other kinds of surgery that you can take it into. And it's an elegant technique, but needs a little bit of uh, courage as you, as you do it, and I'll show you why. So, um, part of the, in order to sort of uh, come to these conclusions, we did some of this uh, work in the lab as well at Stanford, and, uh, and also from Pittsburgh. So here, I'll demonstrate the points using um, uh, some anatomical pictures, and then show corresponding uh, videos. So this is the area you're trying to access. You're trying to access the area behind the posterior clinoid, behind the uh, dorsum cella, and you're looking at that retroinfundibular area. And obviously the gland is in your way. This is some of my dissection from a long time ago now, from 2013, uh, when I was in the lab, in the skull based lab. And the point I want to show, so this is, you're looking on the left side of the pituitary gland here. This is your carotid artery there. This is your, it's, you know, we call it the carotid clinoid or uh, ligament, but it's, it's effectively the correlation of your proximal ring. If you think about the proximal and distal ring when you do a transcranial procedure, this equates to um, what you can consider proximal ring, but looking at your nasally. And obviously the fundamental concept in, uh, in all these <coughs> procedures is that you have to appreciate that the gland is covered by two layers. You have the periosteal layer of dura, which is continuous with the cavernous sinus, and then you have the medial layer, which, is, which attaches to the cavernous sinus. And this ligament here attaches the gland to the cavernous sinus, and there's your paracellar carotid, that's your posterior genium. You're also looking at inferior hypoxial artery. So what this technique or these dissections demonstrate is the so-called transcavernous technique where you've made an incision here and you've mobilized the pituitary gland away from the carotid along with the medial wall. Along the medial wall. Therefore, you've exposed the carotid fully and you have to cut this ligament. And that gets you across. There's only one layer here which attaches the pituitary to the gland. Sorry, the pituitary to the, uh, to the uh, carotid. So as you come across here, you get to the posterior clinoids. This is a nice bit of anatomy. You can look at this with angle scopes when you do your uh, complex pituitaries. This is your interclinoidal ligament. Again, we're used to thinking about this coming transcranially, which goes from your posterior clinoid to the anterior clinoid. And when you see this landmark, you know that medial to that is your supraclinoidal carotid, and lateral is the third nerve. And then once you've exposed that, then taking this out, you know, depending upon what you're trying to do, taking this out is not difficult. You take out the posterior clinoid, you can either drill, kerosene. When you take it out, you always get a big gush of uh, bleed from the cavern sinus. But if you have a bit of certain flow seal and patty, it's very, it's dead easy to control. But without that, you'll be struggling. It's no point trying to put bits of surgery cell just won't work and keep floating out and you'll be wasting all your time. So this was one of the initial papers from Juan's group that outlined this technique. So I'll show some uh, videos. So this, we, just, we talked about this ligament that attaches the, um, which is the equivalent of the proximal ring. And that's where the middle clinoid is. So yesterday when we talked about exposing the carotid, the paraclinoid carotid, that's the key technical nuance, how to remove that bit of bone over this ligament so that you can do these kind of procedures or access pituitary tumors that have gone <coughs> into the cavernous sinus. So let's look at, um, uh, and a quick note about 
if you were to do, looking at this picture, so this demonstrates that this is your outer layer of the gland, which is continuous with the, you can see your uh, paracardial carotid here. And this is a bit of the cavernous sinus where you have the blue stuff. And this is your medial, the, the layer, the, the meningeal layer of the uh, dura of the lining of the gland, which is continuous with the medial wall. So when you're doing a transcavernous transposition, you're going across here, exactly where that is, finding, making sure that the Doppler, that the carotid is lateral to you. When you do a subcellar extradural, which is kind of the easiest one to do, you're simply going outside this ledge, you're just finding the floor of the cellar, and then pushing everything up, and then resecting the dorsum in that way. And when you go intradural, you're effectively opening up, um, you're opening up all the layers around the gland, including the meningeal layer, and then you're mobilizing the pituitary gland, so the gland is effectively naked when you're doing that. So this, for example, let's see, so this is, Commonly, you can also combine these techniques. You don't have to do transcapulous both sides. You don't have to do, you may just need to do a hemi transposition, so you don't need to disconnect the glandular supply of the, uh, the venous supply of the gland. So, this is demonstrating the technique for how to do a transcapulous. So you found your carotid here. This is the area where the middle thyroid would be. You stick your dissector in, and you identify, you, you have to make sure with the Doppler that you are medial to the carotid there. And once you get into that right layer, you have to divide these ligaments, working backwards the carotid and thyroid ligament. And you can begin to get a glimpse of the base of the posterior clinoid. And you have obviously one structure that you must divide, which is the inferior hypophyseal artery. And you divide that more distally when you do this sort of procedure. And then you see that comes out a bit of the dorsum. And then on the other side, this can come out once you mobilize the gland. You don't do anything, it might just come out all extradurally, and you get that gush of uh, cavernous sinus bleed, because essentially the posterior clinoid sits in the roof of the cavernous sinus, so every time it comes out it's a bit unsettling, but you get, get a little bit of bleed. So this sort of extradural technique, or plus the uh, transcavernous technique, in our opinion is better when you're doing chordomas, chondrosarcomas, meningiomas, where you want to really attack the blood supply up front. But if you're doing an intrinsic tumor like a cranial, or you're doing a glioma, you can do more intradural technique, which is slightly easier. So you can see this is like a heavy transposition. So you've got completely intradural. The medial wall is still intact. And now you're dividing the inferior hypophyseal artery. Uh, this is more distal division of the inferior hypophyseal rather than the transcapulus where you're taking it more proximally. And that gives you a nice view of uh, the retroinfundibular area. And this was a, a hypothalamic, uh, optical hypothalamic glioma, for example. And you can leave it attached on the other side because you know there's obviously an incidental problem with DI every time you disconnect the gland, then you take away the, uh, the part of the interrupt the part of the venous supply. And sometimes you can do the same thing, but you do it on both sides, and then that allows you to push the gland right up um, uh, if you do it on both sides, and then it gives you exposure on either side of the gland. So this is a cranial, for example, where you're doing the transposition, the intradural transposition on both sides and pushing the gland uh, right up in order to get to the, uh, the abnormal area. Okay, so that's the sort of exposure. So the limitation is, when you're doing a sub dural approach, which is the easier way to do it, the key limitation is the rostral, the superior exposure is compromised. So you have to look at the pathology and go, what, what do I need to do here and decide accordingly. Because essentially you're pushing the gland up and the gland there's only so much you can compress the gland. The, it's important to, with the intradural technique, with the transcapulous technique, it's important to remember to sacrifice the IHA, the inferior hypophyseal. You don't want to avulse it off the carotid. You have to divide the proximal ligament and you know you can do it unilaterally or bilaterally. 